great art by Abby. Um, these SMOCA in the Studio events are organized by the SMOCA Advisory Council alongside our amazing development team, who I would like to give a shout out to Aaron Kravonik, Director of Development. Um, behind the table, Lauren Zapian. And I want to give a special thank you to Julie Gannis, who's our curator of engagement, for being here, helping with this weird hybrid thing that we're doing now, um, which is recording artist talks so we can have them online, and finally being here in person, which is wonderful too. I want to give a, a, a big thank you to the advisory council, especially to Barbara Askenazi. She's sitting right there today. And we have thank you. And we also have Linda Kilgore here who's on the advisory council and they're just um, putting, oh sorry, and so still, oh my god, it's right here, um, who've been busy putting together these events. We have an upcoming tour of a local collector. We will be at Cattle Track in the spring doing studio visits again. So just trying to find ways of having these deeper engagements with artists out in the community. If you're not a member at Scottsdale Arts, I would encourage you to join so you can be the first to know about um, and get those invitations. So we were super lucky to partner with Christine Cassano uh, today. She has been so generous in opening up her space and throwing up this beautiful gallery show. Sorry, throwing up doesn't sound right. <laughs> very easy, it's gorgeous um, in this space. So art space is um, a development that supports artists by providing affordable and sustaining, sustainable living spaces that are live work. So it's another reason we thought it would be a great chance to get a kind of insider view of that. Christine's been here for several years and I know it's been an important space for her and for her career as an artist. So today we're going to have a short conversation. Christine and I talk about the work that's here, um, talk about some of the work that's in her studio and her kind of progression um, over the past uh, many years. Many evolutions in her work that I'm excited to talk about. Um, so before we do that, I just want to give you a quick intro uh, for Christine. She was born in Texas and raised in Virginia. She's an interdisciplinary artist, living here, obviously, um, who exhibits regionally, nationally, and internationally. As a person with synesthesia, Christine explores converging systems, a lot of systems, of our modern hyper-connected world. Sound as a medium has become central to her approach of painting, sculpture, and installation. She weaves together audible and visual, visible structures and patterns of biological, technological, and cosmological systems. Christine is a recipient of the 2018 Artist Research Grant from the Arizona Commission on the Arts. In two, 2016, she was awarded a Contemporary Forum Artist Grant from the Phoenix Art Museum. In 2015, a residency at the University of West Georgia. And she was also a recipient of the Phoenix Institute of Contemporary Art Grant, resulting in a published catalog of her work. Is that the book that we have available? Yeah, so everyone will have a goodie bag to take home with you at the end. So we'll, um, we're gonna have a talk and then we're gonna try to split up probably in two groups for tours of the studio space, which is a short walk from here. So we'll just kind of help uh, divide up into a couple groups and take 10 to 15 minutes exploring the studio space, which has a lot of uh, works that show her evolution, but um, also just a lot of materials and fun things to look at. Um, for those of you who might stay back for the first tour, we're going to show a couple videos on the monitor in the corner um, for entertainment. You can look around, have water. Um, hopefully, you know, the next time, maybe the next time we have an event, we'll have uh, food and nibbles will be a little bit braver. So um, please help me in welcoming Christine. All right, so we're gonna, again, can everybody hear okay? Okay, awesome. I just wanted to say a lot to the Smoka uh, for, for putting this together, um, for the opportunity, and for all of you for coming here. It's, it's been really nice to reconnect with people in person, and it's also just really nice to engage in the arts in this way, so thank you.
Okay, so your work is biographical in many ways. Um, that is also universal. So looking in and looking out. Um, and there's a lot of movement between this kind of micro views and macro views. So getting close in and pulling further back apart. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about about those push and pulls between micro and macro, however you want to handle that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot to unpack. There. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I think ultimately the the work does span micro to macro, um, and a lot of that is, uh, I think, as all artists, our journey is really uh, what is kind of we learn and we grow and we evolve, and as we do that, the vocabulary and the, the uh, things that we're exploring, hopefully your awareness evolves and, and it expands. Um, and so I think that the work started out very macro. It started out looking at, uh, you know, I um, love philosophy, I love uh, learning philosophy and ancient wisdom, but I also am really devoted to science and research. And so, you know, it went through this, the first generation was this biology and technology interdependence. Um, I was seeing that happen within our world over and over again in this modern era, but also too I had, it does become bio biographical in the respect that I was also dealing with uh, some significant health issues uh, and, and had uh, hip replacements and parts replaced. And so uh, I went kind of into the work looking at these micro uh, components, you know, cellular function, um, but how that could be interdependent with technology. And then as I grew as an artist, and, and it was interesting because I thought that that was actually gonna, I was kinda gonna, as an artist, go in that trajectory uh, and go more into like body vessel identity. But then I think as I kind of grew and healed and cut past things, I have a background in the environmental industry, so it became, my awareness became, I wanted to shift that focus a little bit. Uh, and so I started looking at uh, ecology and technology together. Circuits kind of always playing a part in that, right? Um, circuits playing a part in the biology part, and you know, so there's certain motifs that I've carried along with me. Uh, and, um, and then from there, you know, I, as I grew, it just kind of grew into looking at aerial views from above. Um, I come from a family of aviators and, and astronauts, and so I was looking at that, kind of fixated on that, but then trying to expand consciousness and take it all the way out to the cosmos. And those, maybe you can point generally, if it's possible, because mm -hmm. I know that some of those works that you're talking about are on in this corner of the room, so people have an idea of what they're how to connect what you're saying to the yeah. So some of those are there, some of the technology mm -hmm. um, systems are in view here. Yeah. And so I think in that in, in that far corner, that's kind of where this biological portion started. So this is much older work in the in the in that first area. And then we kind of traverse over to looking at the aerial views and kind of this this technology, but integrated with you know, a bit of Cosmo, you know, type of thing. Um, and then, we're, you know, um, eventually leading into these sound pieces as, as things progressed on. Before so. we get into the sound pieces, I'm interested to hear you talk a little about synesthesia. Mm -hmm. So how it presents for you, um, and how, how yeah. or if it impacts your artwork. Yeah, so to, like, in kind of parlaying from the first question, which, you know, the idea of like how an artist interprets the world. There's a really great um, quote from uh, Edwin Hopper, I think, and it's, uh, art is an outward expression of, a, of an inner life, right? And, and that perception and that, um, that experience of the artist will always inform their outward output. Um, paraphrasing. <laughs> um, and I feel like uh, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, I have what's called synesthesia, and that is a abnormality, kind of wonderful in a way, I and mean, it's not a hindrance, but um, like a lot of people with synesthesia, we're called synesthetes, synesthetes I guess. Uh, most of them, I kind of fall into the classic category of 
most don't know that they even have it because it's an inner perception. But what synesthesia means is it's literally a fusion of two different senses. Um, and you have, we have five senses, so they can be interconnected in a variety of different ways. So most these people with synesthesia do not experience synesthesia in the same way, but there are categories. Uh, I have a, four forms of it, uh, but you know, so my, my vocabulary, my letters and numbers have color. Um, goes a little further than a lot of synesthetes. Mine have color, gender, and personality. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I also have uh, where it presents any time I listen to audio, uh, not necessarily music, but sound, uh, I get really intense visuals without trying. It just it turns on, and it always has. And then touch is very much the same, right? So t I experience touch, and I'm able to see it in these really just intense forms that are very much form-like. Um, and, you know, that's not a thing we talk about like, in general. Like, you know, it wasn't until I was 21 and I told someone about my numbers having color and it just kind of opened the door of like, wait, not everybody has these crazy experiences because it's an inner perception. Um, and so where that kind of translates into the work is it allows me to see these unusual connections within um, within the world that I'm able to try to fuse together. But it's also important to note, I've really, the reason I've never really talked about it much before now is I've never really wanted, I don't want to make work about synesthesia. I don't want to just recreate it or, you know, I want to be able to utilize it as, it's, as one of the tools or as one of the ways that I approach the work, but do that in a really thoughtful way, you know. I think when we talked about it before, you said it would, it would be really hard to try to reproduce it, right? Yeah, I mean... To reproduce that experience. You can't, I mean, yeah, and you're going to lose it because it actually moves in three-dimensional space and form. And so, uh, you know, even if I could with all the AV technology now, but it's still not what I want to, you know, to do with the art. You know, um, you know it's kind of like Renaissance where you just paint a picture and... You know, right, so, right. Um, but it would be really, I think, difficult. And every city is a little different in how they, you know, there's not a formula. Right, it's so. a unique experience. But I do know that, you know, for, um, you know, kind of one of the things is frequency is a huge variable in how that, you know, it changes with color and, and light and form. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's talk a little about form that has played an important role in your work. Yeah. The pheromena. <laughs> is it a say it right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there are some that are, this form is hanging in these sculptures, a couple on either side that you can, you can touch and they mm -hmm. make sound. Yeah. Um, but I would love to hear you talk a little about, about that as a form, how, mm -hmm. how you became interested in it, what is it, because I, I didn't yeah. Well, and so I'll start with the term. The term pheromena means uh, it's a biological or medical term. It's it it's the term for any hole that runs through a bone uh, and that basically allows our viscerals to move through it. And so it is uh, our vertebrae all have pheromena because our spinal bone cord runs through it up to our brain. Our skull again pheromena. Our eye sockets pheromena. Uh, and so. In essence, it's this really interesting protective portal uh, that allows us to be human. Um, I mean, animals have it too, but you know, it allows it, it protects our our viscerals. And where that came in, so I learned that term from a friend of mine who's a neurologist. But and that was more recent, so they kind of just acquired this name more recently. But when I started working with the form back in 2012-13. It was really uh, about the accident that I had had. I had shattered my hip and uh, waited seven, I had to wait seven years for a surgical hip replacement. Um, and kind of during that time, this was a very personal cathartic form for me to meditate on, to work through, uh, to make work about, you know. Um, but in biology and technology and kind of looking at all that. I've cast them in metal and done all these different things. 
Um, and then, you know, I think as I moved through, they just kind of took on more interesting meaning. There's a, there's a piece right by the front door that's called Morphogenesis. And so Faramana led into this discovery of biology where um, I'm fascinated with how our cells grow and develop. Uh, and so that form still became part of that study. Um, and it was just this physical way to physically manifest the action of you know, how morphogenic fields work and how um, morphogenic unfolds. And from there, it's very interesting because, and I, and I tried to put it away for a while because I was like, but, you know, how, how do all these things fit together? And it wasn't until um, during the course of COVID, I started working on all these really intricate meditative drawings and paintings. They were very, they had a lot of depth to them. And um, there's one in the, there's a couple in the back, but, um, and when I stood all the way back, and you can even see it here in, in this, is you can look at the foramen itself, which is the little bronze pieces on the shelf next to it, and you can see that same pattern happening within the work. And so I realized it's kind of taking it out into the, the cosmological um, sense. So I've tried in different capacities to carry it all the way through in the work, mostly because I just can't stop making them, <laughs> you know? So there's something there, you know? There's something really uh, intense for me there. And that's a good segue into how you came to use them in these sound-based works. Yes. Um, so do you want to talk about how you came to incorporating sound or anything you want to tell about that, that process? Yeah, it's, uh, I think, uh, during during COVID, you know, we were all experiencing a lot. Uh, I turned to meditation, and I turned to uh, these kind of just hyper connected drawings that turned into these, you know, very three dimensional looking landscapes. And the whole time, I listened to um, sound frequencies and all these different things. And I even talked to Marcus, my partner, about you know, I think it's time to take synesthesia into the work and explore sound. And I'm very honored today. I've got two, two collaborators here from the sound community, Shamit Bora and Jimmy Peggy. I've worked in both. We have pieces here today that are collaborative. But I met, like three months later, just out of the blue, met Shamit uh, up in a, in a camping trip where um, uh, during COVID, we were all, like, everybody was camping. Um, <coughs> and we immediately knew we needed to start working together. And, uh, and I wanted to work with a sound artist, not really a musician, just because you know, I really wanted to focus on the sound. Uh, and through that, uh, a couple steps in between, but you know, I was introduced to Jimmy. Um, he uh, spearheads a, a sound group here in the Valley, an experimental sound group. And we started talking and immediately connected over certain things as well, um, in terms of the electromagnetic frequencies and things. And, and that's how that story came to be. And it was just really a beautiful way to integrate. We now hold sound meetings here uh, in, the, in this gallery. Uh, and it's just been a wonderful experience to become immersed in that. And some of this work that you see is direct, directly related to that. Can you talk about, yeah, about that? Yeah. So this being behind me here, um, I took, so the three Ferrano that are on the panel next to it, uh, are cast in bronze, and then uh, and that came from installations where I've had it connected to my own hair and to other filaments. Um, again, foramina being that um, hole within the bone, so connecting biological to it. But taking those off the suspension part um, and putting them onto a table and taking frequency and vibrating it through different equipment which you'll get privy to in the studio. Uh, we'll see how it's done. Uh, you know, I'm able to literally use certain frequencies to vibrate them, dip them in paint and vibrate them across the, the surface and using different colors of paint and, uh, and then hand connecting them after that. And then in Jimmy and I have a large panel over here and you can read a little bit more about it. There's a QR code to the sound where you can hear, but we actually took two different distinct elements 
Uh, Jimmy goes out and records electromagnetic frequency, turns that into an audible form, and then we vi run that through other equipment and we turn that into a vibrated form and do the same process. Um, and we use two different frequencies or two different approaches, the darker color being one, the lighter color being another. Um, but the beautiful part about this for me is all of it coming together and taking a sound that you can't even hear, because that's what we're doing, this electromagnetic frequency is sound that is not visible or not audible to the human ear, and we're turning it into a visible, tangible form. And that to me is just really the, you know, kind of the important part about waiting to use synesthesia in the work, or just, I mean, always using it, but waiting to I have it find its voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's beautiful. Okay. Um, oh, my next question was going to be about kind of like transformation and where you see your work going. But I feel like you're you're are you going to stick with sound for now? You're yeah. you seem captivated by it at the moment. I'm really and you know who knows. I mean you know well <laughs> there's also uh, what was it? Uh, Joseph Campbell says life is like. I'm, gonna, I'm paraphrasing, but yeah, do. he's like, life is like arriving to a movie late, <laughs> trying to ask no one questions about what's going on, and then pick unexpectedly having to leave early. <laughs> and I feel like life is that, but I also feel like art is that. Um, you know, there's been many times where I thought things were going to go in one direction. You know, here we are in sound, right? I would have never predicted that. But I feel very much at home with this work. And I'm really, there's so much in it that is, that I feel like is the culmination of all of the things that all of this work has done. That, um, you know, I have, I, and, but I'm still in love with material. I love the bronze and the porcelain. Um, Pharamina's been trying, you know, it's either bronze or porcelain that I shape those in. They all have my fingerprints in them, they're all original. So I have this still affinity with material. And so I'm looking to create ways to uh, incorporate sound, but still have it be visible. Yeah. Really wonderful. Thanks. Um, I think, I hope that gives everybody a little bit of background about the works that are on view here. We're gonna go and tour through the studio, so of course you'll be to see some things, you'll get a chance to ask questions. Oh yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, and um, we'll be here until five o'clock, right? Yeah, right. Thank you.